the GSOW secret cabal interviews. <laughs>
doing it that way made me feel like I was contributing right away, but I was also learning the process as I went along, and, and it got different people, different topics, so it gave me a chance to kind of poke around and see what was already there. The three you did, you took a skepticality interview with Tom Merritt, Point of Inquiry podcast from, what was the person's name? Uh, Ibn Warwick. Okay, and then Skeptic Zone, you were able to post on the Ripley's Believe It or Not page. I don't even remember that. What was that one about? Oh, I can't, oh it was an interview, and I'm not going to come up with the, the person's name, but it was I think it was the vice president of Ripley's Believe It or Not. And he was on Skeptic Zone, that's right. He had given an, an interview about what kind of people they are looking for in terms of was who who the people who were going to fit into their Ripley's Believe It or Not books, their museum and, and their exhibits there. That's what it was. Right. I can say and, that and, again. <laughs> it's fine. So the the backwards edit, what it does is it gets more attention to our podcast because in the case of Ibn Warwick, Tom Merritt, and the Ripley's Believe It or Not pages, we were able to take three different skeptic podcasts and use them as citations. Hopefully someone in the future, or maybe many someones, will find out about the skeptic community, or at least about our podcasts that we have out there, based on an edit that you made back in July of 2014 that was something, you know, kind of a simple edit of sorts. Yeah, it was just fun. Um, I think mostly what I did was find interesting quotes. I listened to each of the podcasts and tried to find interesting quotes. I think the Tom Merritt one, there wasn't a section for the information that, that was on that interview, so I actually wrote a whole paragraph myself <laughs> on that one. <laughs> but the rest of them, I just kind of um, added just a line or two of, of a particular um, statement that the person had said. Right. And now when I'm training, I don't, this isn't the first edit people get to make. We have a lot of little tiny things that I put together that will give you some confidence to go in and start making changes on Wikipedia and give you, you know, confidence to be able to make these bigger edits. But then after you're finished with the backwards edits, I had giving you a small rewrite. This was mostly things that needed to have citations repaired. Um, maybe a paragraph reworked, and some small things. The page wasn't in horrible shape. It just needed some updating, but you took it a little further than that and went <laughs> full-blown, which is, seems to be your personality, and that's that's terrific. I'm super excited to have you on our team. Um, several, oh, several people have done that. I find that really interesting when I'll tell them to just add this photo to a page and then the next thing I know they've added the photo and added a few citations and cleaned up citations and reworded a couple paragraphs and the next thing I know they have a really nicely written page. <laughs> it's better than it was. So you had worked on Sprague de Camp, who is somebody that was a friend of Isaac Asimov, from what I understand, right? Back in the yes, day? Yes, I believe so, yeah. Science yeah. fiction writer. Yeah. So you were able to rewrite his page and uh, made quite a bit of improvements to it. And then you added some photos to some different pages that we had already had uploaded. I just wanted you to just get more practice. Plus, you made some corrections to the Barry Carr page and the Skeptics Toolbox page, and oh, quite a bit. Yeah. yeah, well, I've got it all written down here, so that's I'm not going from memory here. I don't have. <laughs> it seems much. like a lot. That's cool. Oh, yeah. And there was <laughs> I don't even more. remember all of it. Oh, there's quite a few things that you had just taken part in. Just This is part of the training. Then what happens is once you finish your backwards edits, and I feel comfortable with you starting on a rewrite, I have a list of, oh gosh, maybe 150 pages of people who are in the skeptic community. A lot of them I learn about from podcasts like Skeptic Zone or Point of Inquiry or especially Skepticality. We have a couple other podcasts that we watch, which uh, Skepticule. Token Skeptic, and uh, Meet the Skeptics. We've almost done every episode of Meet the Skeptics. We've almost added them to every page that we can. There's a few that we haven't that are we're waiting for total rewrite. This person that you did a rewrite on was someone I had heard an interview with on Skepticality, and you just went nuts, and it was incredible. Tell me about... It's Heather Dewey Hagborg is her name. She 
was really cool. I knew nothing about, I, I, I was attracted to her. You had given me a list of, I think based from some of our um, emails or, or whatever, you, you kind of kept track of some of my interests. So when you provided me with some to choose from, there were already people or, or topics that I, I felt like I was, would, might be interested in all of them. But I ended up picking Heather Dewey Hagborg because she was an artist, is an artist, and she actually takes DNA samples and she's written computer programs so she can simulate a face based on information that she gets from strangers' DNA through cigarette butts or gum and that kind of thing. And she she really caught my interest. She She wanted to be provocative and she really was. She's actually sparked a lot of conversation in that particular community about privacy issues and who can use people's DNA and, and as along with like do-it-yourself biogenetics which I thought was really interesting I really hadn't even thought of that issue um, and then it was really exciting because I got to email her and and make contact with this person that I had been researching for a few weeks and she turned out to be so generous with her time and she ought she let us use some pictures. Um, she uploaded them on Wiki Commons for us, and that was very exciting to see all that pull together. Oh, it was, and she was she, she, her. She had had a Wikipedia page, and that's always what I do. Is I, I ask for you to take a page that is already exists and then change it because one of the more difficult things with Wikipedia is making a Wikipedia page from someone a brand new page. That's a lot more work because you've got to prove notability and. It, it's just very difficult to do. Only people who have a lot more experience will, I usually say, yeah, go ahead and do that. She already had a Wikipedia page, which was a stub, which was really a bad page. It was just really embarrassing, right? I think she only had like three sentences on there. I don't think, and maybe one reference or something. I don't know. I don't remember exactly, but it was pitiful. It was, there wasn't anything. No pictures. It was, it was really embarrassing. Yeah, I think, I don't even know if it, I think it might have had an info box, but that was it. That was really <laughs> literally just maybe three sentences about what she was doing. So when I picked that one, I had no idea what I was, it sort of opened up this whole world. That was really fascinating. I think that's like part of my personality is I just want to keep reading and reading and reading and reading. It's hard to know when to stop, but it's, um, it was very cool to, to I, and I knew the thing that I was challenged on that page was I didn't know anything about taking DNA samples, so I actually had to read enough about it. I didn't have to be an expert, but I had to be able to read enough about it to put it in my own words. And I watched a lot of YouTube videos. Thank goodness for YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> this lessons for anything, you know. And and um, so when I was able to, I sent. I sent kind of a draft to Heather, and, and she was like, yeah, that looks great. So I was really happy about that, that I could explain it very simply. I didn't have to be a scientist. I didn't have, I don't, I don't have that kind of background, but I was able to just piece together enough information. There's lots of articles to tap into, and so that was, that was good. It was a, I was a, I felt like I was really able to pull the page together. Oh, and it's beautiful. I'm looking at it again right, right now, and I remember when you were writing this, I would, you know, as I was still training you, I would go in and I would constantly, you know, check it over to make sure that you were on the right track. And um, I was learning as you were learning, and it was fascinating. I kept saying, get more, get more. I want more. And you're like, no problem. And uh, then we finally got to a point where it was mostly written, and then that's when you were able to contact Heather. We went through Derek Colin Duna from Skepticality, because that's where we got the lead that, of who she was. And he was able to put us in contact with her. Is that right? Uh, no, I actually emailed her website, and she con oh, we we were gonna right. go to Derek second, but I just I just got brave, and um, it was the first time I'd ever reached out to anybody, and I was just like, I'm just gonna try it. I've got her website, I've got her email, and see what happens. She wrote right back, so I've been very fortunate that the people that I've been working with have been really supportive of the project and excited about. Well, I mean, they've got, they know, most of them, I think, know that they have Wikipedia pages, but, and they want them to be to representative of the work they're doing. So. Right. And it needs to be right. And we always tell people, we, we try not to contact the person until we're really done with the page because we don't want to 
be influenced one way or the other to take something out or add something in that shouldn't probably be there. We want to be stern because uh, we are a team and there's more than one person watching over your shoulder. It kind of removes the bias. If if you were to try to, I don't know, gloss over something that was controversial or something, I think we would probably, as a team, say, uh-uh, you've got to, you've got to put that in. You know, it has to be there in that spot. And with Heather, I'm looking at this page and I remember thinking to myself, I want to know what this looks like. Um, I, cause there was no photos, absolutely nothing. And I said, I want to know what this looks like. I, I'm, I'm fascinated. I, I looked at some of the videos you had put up and you were able to approach her. People listening may not realize that we can't take a photo that exists on the internet and add it to Wikipedia pages. It has to be uploaded by the owner of the, of the photo or the video or of the, um, audio before we can stick it on a Wikipedia page. Because once it's up, it's more or less they lose the rights to that image. I believe so. I think I think they, they have to agree that, that people can use it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Free yeah. use, free use. She was very generous, and she gave us a lot of photos she uploaded for us. And the page looks so nice now that you have it on there. And you even have a little audio of her voice, which is fantastic. I think that's something that one of my... One or two of my uh, team members came up with the idea of doing this a year ago, adding some audio to everybody's page. So if we can get it, and I think that's, it just makes the page. It's beautiful. Well, anyway, let's leave Heather for the moment because it's, it just shows, how do I say, this is this is the Heather Dewey Hogboard Hag page. Yep. Hag. Hagboard page. Yep. Hagboard page. Hagboard. As, as envisioned by Janice Boynton. So it's kind of like an artist you've created. Uh, this page in a lot of ways it is your interpretation of this person and then once it goes up on wikipedia of course it is freely editable by anyone and um you know so if there's things that need to be updated or removed or changed or anything like that any wikipedia editor can come in and they can make the changes and um, and that's the way wikipedia works really yeah and i kind of expect that i mean i i kind of I kind of see it's not my page. It's it's the page that that I put together. You know, I I looked at all those sources, but there may be other sources that I missed, or there may be things that I emphasized that could be de-emphasized or whatever. I mean, any page that I've I've written, I kind of expect that somebody else. And I think it's good because I have had people go back in and make some changes to the page, some of the pages that I've worked on. And they're they're generally improvements, you know. So mm -hmm. I I don't I guess that's another thing you asked about personalities. You have to be willing to take that all in stride. It's not personal. It's something to make Wikipedia better. It's better. Mm -hmm. It's something to make the the writing better, or you know, the to represent the person or the subject in a in a clearer way. So um, you can't take that stuff personal. It's just it's just sort of it's just how it is. I mean, it's it's. I mean, I, I feel like I want people to, to, who are making the edits to understand the rules, and that's why I'm learn, trying to learn the rules as well. So you can't just go in and just make any old change, but I, I'm, always, I'm always happy when people are looking at the page and saying, okay, this, is, this needs a little bit of improvement here. And, it, and it's wonderful. So now that finished your, your training. So after you finish your training, then I put you on a, a team. And I have two English teams at this moment. One is Team Curie and one is Team Sagan. Your team leaders are Ryan Harding, Richard McDonald, and Christine Daly. She's up there in the area near you. From what I understand, she lives in New England also. What happens is the team is supposed to work together to everybody works on whatever page they want to work on. But it's maybe 15, 20 people who should be focusing on each other's threads and making comments and talking and getting feedback and to each other. And if you guys wanted to, you could work on team, you know, a, a single page together, or you could work on maybe a theme, like maybe you would pick artists or maybe you would pick astronomers or something like that and just do you know, six months. Let's just work on this, this subject. There's, those are the kinds of things I envisioned with these different teams. We also have teams that are like team German, uh, team Dutch, that kind of thing, so they're languages. But as they grow and we receive too many people for one group, you know, it's hard to have 50 people working together, then we branch off into smaller groups. 
So you're on Team Curie. What's the first thing you do after you decide you're you're out of training? I think I said, do you want to do a controversial page now? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! Now that you've got your feet wet. Well, you know, um, I I looked at the Bud Hopkins page is the is the one that I did um, after Heather's page. I was interested because his page was in fairly rough shape there um but i what struck me first was that he was actually um an artist an abstract expressionist artist and i know in his later life he got into ufo research and he believed in alien abductions and things and that was interesting to me in its own way but when i looked at his page i i kind of saw you know i'm not seeing this as a whole person here i'm only seeing one side of or one interpretation that's that's a case where someone had started the page and and um i didn't there were a lot of um it's it was like um, primary research instead of secondary research so mm -hmm. the, the references weren't um some of them some of them i i wasn't sure whether they actually fit in with the wiki guidelines and stuff and and at the very least there needed to be more references on the page. It was it was in pretty rough shape, and there were no pictures of his artwork at all. So that's kind of what struck me about that too. Not just that it, we thought the UFO community is pretty passionate. However, people fall on that particular um, subject, whether they believe in it or not. They seem to be really passionate. But and I thought that that should be represent both sides should kind of be represented on that but I also thought gee you know this guy spent half of his career as an artist and that that was hardly mentioned at all on the page right and I was mentioning to my my boyfriend Mark Edward today or yesterday I think something about Bud Hopkins and that I was going to talk to you today and he said oh yeah Bud Hopkins UFO all of this guy I'm like you know who that is he goes well yeah of course I do you know <laughs> I was really surprised that I didn't know who he was before you had taken him on, and he's and, a good um, idea. yeah, and he's he's when I say controversial, it's controversial because he is not a skeptic. Um, he is some, but he was a believer in UFOs and UFO abductions and hypnotism and all that kind of stuff. For um, well, you know, I believe in hypnotism too, but hypnotism of to find. That people had been abducted by alien and everything. Very interesting person. And then Robert Schaefer, I think, is the person who brought us to my mind because Robert Schaefer is an expert on UFOs. So I like to keep us diverse. I don't want us only working on, you know, one type of page. I like it to be a variety of pages astronomers, artists, musicians, comedians, scientists in all different kinds of fields, and cryptozoology and all that kind of stuff. So it's all really fascinating. I I just like yeah. Um, I liked it more than I thought. I mean, I I thought it it was going to be interesting, but I really I don't know. I I don't know whether it's a result of working so closely. You spent well, I spent um I think like just about a month just reading about Bud Hopkins, and you grow like you get you develop this sort of familiarity with with the person and, and the kind of a fondness, you know, wh whether I agree with his, all of his views or not, it do that doesn't really matter. He was a really fascinating person and he, that kind of drew me in. So it was, that's another page. I, I, I still have notes that aren't even up on the page yet. I probably, <laughs> I probably could keep going, but yeah, I've, I've left had it to push for you others. Off that page, which yes. I had to say, you're yeah, done. You're done. You're like, well, wait a minute. I'm like, no, you are no, done, girl. You're done. You're done. You have to move on. We cannot become. I mean, I, I remember it's telling not a book. you that you're gonna have to write a book. I mean, seriously. Yeah. yeah. After some no, time, that, I think that was the first time that I had. Um, there were there is so much information on the on you know things that he's written, things that other people have written about him, and so it really challenged me as a. I kind of got, lo I did kind of get lost, kind of in a good way, but also it was a learning experience that, like, if you're writing for Wikipedia, that's a different kind of writing than writing for a journal or writing your own research paper or writing a book or whatever. So you may have all these notes, but you kind of have to sift things down and, and really get the essence of the 
you know, for the for the Wikipedia page, and and so that's something that I'm still learning how to do. That I still kind of go overboard, um, but I I I've, <laughs> I've kind of taken it to heart that that you know it's sort of like this is a different kind of writing, and that I don't know if I would have been able to really understand that internally if I hadn't experienced going through working through that process. I'm kind of a process person. Yeah, totally agree. It was all the training that I give people. I try to make sure that I give a little bit of this and a little bit of that so that they will be able to, maybe when they finish the training, they won't know everything, but they'll at least know how to ask the questions that they need to ask and maybe where to find the information that they need to find because there's no way anybody's going to be able to come out of my training and know everything. It's just not possible. So with Bud, you were able to do something a little more controversial. You had a little bit of pushback from one of his, what would you call him? He was a supporter of Bud? Oh, yeah. I think he, yeah. I think he, he really, I think his, I'm just taking a guess. I don't know the person, but I, I would I would hazard a guess that he was really aligned with a lot of Bud Hopkins' viewpoints and maybe didn't understand that a wiki page really has to show both sides if there's if there's criticism like I put I put criticisms on Heather's page because that they were there they were in print and that's part of the whole story and so yeah I think I think you don't mean to like when you're working on the page but I think you, you may upset people if if the if they think that what you're putting on as references doesn't fit with how they see the page should be right yeah, I think I, I think I was actually trying to be pretty diplomatic. You know, I, I think I worked really hard to encapsulate some of the criticisms without being like you don't want to attack somebody either. I mean, you want to be, you want to be. I don't know. That's maybe that's just my personality. One of Bud Hopkins' supporters had come into the Wikipedia page after you had finished it and tried to make some changes that were not following the rules. He was using primary resources work he had done, things he had put on his, his own website to support Bud Hopkins in a way that was not encyclopedia, it's not uh, factual. Would you say that's fair? I would say that's fair. I think it, I think it, yeah. Well, the other thing it was, that he had self-published, I, I believe that he had self-published mm-hmm. the references that he was using, and he wanted those points to be made, but and I, I actually looked for other sources that were not self-published sources and wasn't able to. I may have even included some of the information in the page, but I, my struggle was that I wasn't able to find it in something that wasn't self-published. Right, and self-published um, is not allowed because there's no real editor looking over your shoulder kind of thing. That's a no-no in Wikipedia. Things need to be in notable sources. And the idea is that it should be in a secondary source and not and not self-published because obviously if it's self-published, you could publish and say anything. Yeah, and I, I mean, I thought I did think that that some of the points were interesting and it sort of helped fill out the the whole story. But and and that's that's another thing that I learned um, with working on that page is it's like what what's fact, what's anecdotal. You know, I I tried to find things that were in two or three different places before I started to settle on. That was a really tough life story to to kind of put down onto a page. I tried to look at three or four. If I could find it in two or three different places, um, sometimes it was more, you know, then that's when I started saying, okay, I'm starting to see patterns here about how people interpreted it, Bud's work, or how he interpreted his own work. So that's kind of that was that's kind of tricky to do that when it's so and a lot of a lot of the writing even in secondary sources were was pretty passionate you know they they so it was kind of a tricky and it and it's an issue that you can't say yes this is definitely true or no this is definitely not true you know it's it, there were a lot of gray areas so to try to tease out some of those facts and still work within Wikipedia rules was. It was a challenge. It was, it was an interesting challenge, and I, I hope that I, I mean, I felt like at the end that I was satisfied with the work that I would, you know, that I did. But I can also see if I go back or someone else goes back to it that there, there probably are areas that could be improved. That's that's one of the pages that's, just because it was, after a while, my own 
you know, even though I felt like in some ways I became an expert on Bud Hopkins, I, I read probably, mm -hmm. I don't know, probably 200 articles and a couple, skimmed through a few books. But just a lot of that was just like, okay, how do I figure out what to put on this page? You know, and, and I think next time, now that I've had that experience, I can go through, fingers crossed, I can go through quicker. But it was really, that was, um, it wasn't the same kind of page as Heather's was, you know, the, or the other pages that I'd even done some backward edits on. It was, it was much different. And, and uh, I think you learn, or there's a potential to learn a lot on each page that you do. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, with this person who was going in and changing the page after you had published it and, and changing it, I mean, he was adding his self-published work to it. We were getting a little bit of, well, there was a little worry going on because we were worried that this man was going to turn into a troll and that it was going to be a constant battle. But GSOW, we've been here before with lots and lots of different pages that people who take the page very personally, who can't walk away from it, who possibly, you know, this is the only page they're interested in on Wikipedia. We've dealt with these people many times. So eventually the guy went away and it looks like it's going to be fine. I don't think we're going to have to worry about it. But there was other measures we could have put in place if we had to. We just didn't want to. We wanted to make sure um, that the page stayed strong. And if this man eventually has something that he wants to contribute that's okay to contribute, you know, it's some, something that's correctly cited and correctly published, then we want him to be able to have full access to being able to do so. I was just going to say, I think that's where the talk pages are so important because that's where you can find out, you can touch base with people and and say, I have a question about this. I'm not really sure. Can I get some clarification? And and um, as a new editor, I kind of rely on on that to to. I mean, there's some things I can find out by myself, but I just don't know enough about the whole process to you know. I'd rather go on the talk page and say, you know, can someone just? This is the question I have. This is what I think. But can someone just give me some feedback on this and help me out? And and I think that's that person was encouraged to do that but I don't think he ever so or the person I don't know if it's he or she but the person I don't think the person really understood about what the talk pages were or, or what they were for so right and and by talk pages you're talking about the entire world was able to look at these talk pages and to give you feedback they don't even have to be a person who's logged into Wikipedia and they don't have to be a member of GSO they're just a person who's, who knows what a talk page is and was able to give you feedback. And we rely on them like crazy too. So for people, we have a few, we have had a few critics in the world of uh, the skeptics world that has actually said that GSO does not allow, um, does not work with believers, uh, that they, we silence their opinions. And that's not true because we overwhelmingly use the talk pages on Wikipedia to try to better the page and improve the page and if they have something that they want to contribute they're more than welcome to contribute it and if they want to be a part of the writing of the page they're more than welcome to do so by being in the involved in the discussion on the talk page i mean i yeah i, I want to i don't know that's i i think i think you can be i don't know everybody has their own biases and stuff and i think sometimes they can creep in even when you don't mean them to, but I I value information that's that's not necessarily something that I would think. I don't know. That's what makes this process so interesting. Right, and with GSO, you have the other area that you can talk to people and get feedback immediate. Well, as close to immediately as if somebody's logged in, and hopefully work through the problems you might be having with citations or you know, rewriting a paragraph that you're just not happy with the flow of it. So, you know, we offer a different area of expertise or help, I should say, than general Wikipedia does. So let's talk about your last project. And this is a gentleman that was on our rewrite list. We picked him off the list. Again, this is another one you had no knowledge of, correct? That's correct. His name is Jan Brunvand. I think that's Jan Harold Brunvand, I think is how he pronounces his name. Um, forgive me if that's not correct, but he's a folklorist and he was a professor. He's retired now, but he's a professor at 
the University of Utah. What interested me in first was that, I mean, the, he researched urban legends, which were kind of cool, but the first thing I read about him was that he did some research in Romania um, and also in Norway, and I thought that was really cool. I'm interested in other cultures, so that kind of drew me in at first, and then I realized the urban legend, he actually, they call him Mr. Urban Legend because he's done so much research on it. One of the ones um, that he talked about was Bozo the Clown, which is um, something that I grew up with thinking was true. Um, and it's a, this, this, the Bozo the Clown, those shows used to be taped live and they would have kids come in. And supposedly this one kid got mad at Bozo and swore at him. And Bozo said something like, you know, now that's not very nice to say. And the kid swore at him again. So I, I thought that, that had happened to my my brothers were in Cub Scouts and stuff and they had gone to a live taping of Bozo the Clown in our local area and came back with that story. Well, that's how I remembered it. And I thought that that happened while they were there. And it turns out that no, they, and I asked my brothers, you know, what they remember just recently. And they're like, no, I heard that from somebody else. And so it turned into this pattern Dr. Brunvand um, talks about friend of a friend, that these stories are kind of believable. They're sort of like a little bit fantastical, but y you could almost believe them. And, and one of the things that make them, makes them so believable is that you hear them from a friend. And it hap usually happened to a friend of a friend. I just laughed because that fit that pattern perfectly the, in my own life. And so that, of course, hooked me in, you know, and I, I just... Um, just had to keep reading after that. I'm like, this is so funny. And it turns out he's got a great sense of humor. He's a folklorist. He really believes in bringing the stories back to the people. He got criticized, apparently, at the time for stepping out of the research arena and bringing urban legends to the popular, making them popular books and stuff. And he, he just believed in bringing those stories back to the people. That's where they originated, and that's where they should be, that's where they belong. And I just really, I like the spirit of that. I think that's really cool and a really fun. A lot of his writings are, are very witty and funny and, and just totally enjoyable. Another one I got lost in. <laughs> uh, yeah, Stop already! <laughs> no, no, and we love it too. And as I was, as you say, as I'm going, th as you're going through these now, I'm no longer your trainer, but I was looking it over. And the old page from September of 2014 had three references on here. One photo, which is just a silly photo of him with a pair of ski goggles on for his 75th birthday, and about four paragraphs worth of work. It was really embarrassing. And that's how I look at it as the leader of the GSO project. I think of these pages as just embarrassment, and they're not very respectful. These are people we should have some respect for, and we should we should make sure they have great Wikipedia pages, and shame on us. It's our responsibility as a community to make sure these pages are in great shape. When you are done with this, I'm looking at it now, there's 73 references from 3 to 73. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible. And and it's kind of fun, too, as like you say, I didn't even know who this person was either. And I don't even remember how he made our, our pages to be rewritten for somehow or somehow or the other. This one came across my desk somehow and I just added it to the list. I don't know if he was on a podcast or somebody suggested it. I don't remember. But I was on Facebook one day and one of my Facebook friends, Ben Radford, um, who's a very good friend. Ben Radford was at a conference in Santa Fe, New Mexico just this last month or so. And he posted a couple photos of yawn and i said oh my gosh one of my editors is working on that page stop stop i need those photos <laughs> and so that's funny then that radford the... uploaded the photo yeah, it was just odd and um, he uploaded a couple photos for us to wikimedia commons so that i would have something to give to you as my way of uh, a gift Yay. Photos <laughs> my are way, good. I my love way photos. of contributing and it, it just makes the page look so much more I don't know. The the main photo you have of him there, he's wearing a button, and I'm glad you wrote this under the caption for people who can't see it, but it says, it has his name, and it says fan club button, and I guess he was telling Ben Radford, or his joke that he tells everyone when, when people see that button is, I'm the only one in my fan club, and people were commenting on the Facebook post that Ben had put up about, oh, I love this guy. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I love this guy. Oh, he's incredible. And they were, oh, I'm one of his biggest fans. So, 
you know, I was, I was just like, I'm so glad that you picked this page to work on because this is so beautifully done. This is the man who wrote about the vanishing hitchhiker, which was a fascinating and the choking Doberman and all kinds of stuff. Oh, the, the Mexican pet. <laughs> yeah, it turns out. And you and I were sharing some of these back and forth with each other, like, oh, I'd heard this. Yeah. Oh, I had. Oh, my gosh, I heard that, too. It was real. Oh, here he is. He's a fellow of the Committee of Skeptical Inquiry. That's how we probably made our list, because I pick a lot of people who are fellows for CSI, and I put them on our list of people who need to have pages written or rewritten for. I think that's how he got on the list. Yeah, I believe he spoke at a world a, a world conference, some sort of conference um, yep. for skeptics. In Italy, 2004. Yeah. A speaker yeah. at the World Skeptic Congress in Italy in 2004. He gave the... Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's probably how he came across my... got my attention. Yeah. But it's... Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't... I'm sitting here trying to describe the feeling. Of, like, you, you just open this can and then you just... Or, you know, this open... The, just a little piece of this person's life and then they just sort of develop before your eyes as you do research and stuff and, and turn into whole people with interests. And um, I don't know, it's just really, it's got me hooked, <laughs> actually. <laughs> <laughs> We're not losing I, you anytime soon, huh? No, I remember you had emailed me after um, one of the pages I wrote. And uh, I think because of the Bud Hopkins one, because it took, so I think that one took me two months to do all together and you asked if I wanted a break and I just started laughing and I um told my partner that and he just before I even finished you know he was shaking his head no you're not going to take a break <laughs> I can tell you're not going to take a break <laughs> you just wanted to move on to something else and you know I do want to backtrack really quickly because the Bud Hopkins page I'm a visual person I guess most people are and I'm a photographer by trade and so are you I really think that the photographs that you managed to get we got them through robert schaefer who got them through an ex-wife of bud hopkins that really really just nails the page down as being a professionally crafted beautifully done amazing wikipedia page don't you think yeah i think the uh, even more than the words i think the photos and also the audio that you talked about really help i, th I think it just makes it more accessible because there's so much written word you know, it's it, you get overwhelmed, even if things are separated into sections and stuff. Just having the words there is overwhelming. But you add a few pictures, and all of a sudden, the you know the page just comes to life. Totally agree. I and you know we have a lot of people that we ask for photos. It I take a lot of photos at conferences and things, and I I like these photos that show them in a not just their normal professional business like. Portraits. I really like things that show their personality. Things that are. Um, I mean, I'm looking at Jan's picture right here. He just. He just looks adorable. His eyes were so <laughs> blue when I saw that photo. I thought, Oh my gosh, this man is just. <laughs> you, you know, you just want to sit down and just listen to him talk. Especially yeah. with that, he's got. If he has that Norwegian accent, that would be really something. Is it Norwegian? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. I, I know he's he's off fishing and he's on the ski slopes now. He's retired and and. But I would, if I had ever had the opportunity to meet him, I would just be fascinated. I wouldn't have, to, I wouldn't even want to say anything except hi and, you know, thanks for just, you know, <laughs> being so cool. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll make sure that he hears that. So tell me what you got planned now. You've got a, a new project. I think that you uh, uh, decided to take yeah. on something new. Yeah, I, um, Mark Forsyth and is, is the one on my list now. And, He's a writer and writes about English, um, using English well. I really haven't. That's about all I know about him. At, and and that his wiki page is is just a stub, and it's 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 varied. It's even worse than um, some of the other ones that we've found. So um, it's I think it was just one sentence or maybe two sentences, and really needs to be worked on. So that's I just started that this week. So I haven't I haven't gotten lost in that one yet <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure you will be we just barely he made the list because i heard him on a podcast i think it was skepticality thought wow this guy is interesting and my my um married name for many years was Forsyth, and it was the same spelling without the e on the end so it just stuck out i can't you know i noticed that name and it just really is like whoa Forsyth! wow i that's a name i recognize i lived with it for 20 years <laughs> so i am um, 
he got on the list and I'm glad you picked him off. I, you know, we have a couple other people I, that are just about to finish the training. They finished their backwards edit just today and then last week. And that's Jean Rosenberry and Lauren Carr. And so now I'm assigning them probably six different pages. And I said, pick one. And as I'm looking at the list, and as I say, the list is about 150 different pages on it. It is heartbreaking to me that I want every single one of these pages to be worked on. And yeah. it's, 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 I don't know, it's, when I see you guys working on these pages, it's just heartwarming. I'm, I'm just so appreciative of my team and the people that I have working for me that would do this. I mean, it's incredible what you guys are doing. And it's so important to, to everyone that we're, we're educating people in this way. And so here, here's Jean and Lauren going back and forth with each other, trying to figure out what page they're going to pick. Because as I've told them, it's hard to pick. Yeah. Especially the first page you ever work on, it becomes, it's your first and it becomes like, I don't know, you become an expert on, you feel kind of like you're a stalker, I guess. I don't know how you would. (laughs) It is kind of weird. Yeah. I I wonder, because like, there's so much out there. You don't even realize, you know, I wonder if like somebody like, Jan was on a lot of talk shows, and he had a syndicated newspaper art um, column and stuff, so he would know that he's in the paper. But I just wonder, like, if people realize how much, how many bits and pieces you can find about some of these people. But anyway, just sort of as an in, as an aside, right? Well, especially people who like Jan are a little older, where their careers might have been before the internet. And I don't think that's true necessarily with him as much, but with some people I've found that it's a lot harder to get citations because we tend to use the internet for finding all the citations. We have to come up with creative ways of getting those citations that were only in print or newspaper, you know, newspaper articles or were on TV shows that aren't up on YouTube. They don't have the episode on YouTube or something. It's a lot harder to work on those pages, but it needs to be done. We have to get um, these pages written for these people put out where everybody can enjoy them and learn from them. And I, I think also with Jan, you started working on, or you started trying to clean up some of the Wikipedia pages for the Vanishing Hi- Hitchhikers, I believe. Oh and yeah. The Vanishing and the Choking Doberman and the Baby Train, <laughs> all those pages, you know, so you could, you, this is just like, you know, it's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> You can be here for years. Yeah. Like, that's why I, I, that's why I'm glad I'm in the background going, no, Janet, you're done. Stop. You, you need to move on. You gotta stop. You gotta <laughs> stop because you will continue. I can tell your personality is just that type and you just, I, I, you know, some of our editors they'll work on, I remember Nathan Miller, he goes from one astronomy page to another. He's, oh, well, now that I finished that one, I gotta fix this one. And oh, now that one's done. I gotta work on this one. And oh, and I'm doing the same thing. I was working on uh, this, the um, Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, Perry DeAngelis, the oh, yeah. founder of the Skeptic Guides to the Universe, one of the founders of that whole new, uh, where are you guys over there in the New England, new England. Uh, skeptic yeah. group? <laughs> yeah. And so I started working on his page. I'm creating a page from nothing. And it's a lot of work, but boy, I tell you, the same thing. You click on the next link and you go, well, this page is really bad too. I better work on that at the same time because... You know, I've got a lot of the citations that will kind of work with both pages. I just got to change them a little bit. Oh, and then I need to work on that page, too, because that's really... Oh, and this one? Oh, that's horrible, too. It's definitely so you, a you, rabbit hole. Yeah, you, you, you get, you know, five or six pages going at one time if you're not careful. But it's, it's rewarding, and it kind of does make sense to work on more than one page at a time to some extent because you're, you know that once we publicize the, the page's launch, the people are going to go and look at it. And it's going to get a lot more attention. And then, you know, they're going to click on the links that you leave to it because everybody knows about these rabbit holes you get into when you start looking at one Wikipedia page. You can't stop. It's like eating a bag of chips or something. Yeah. It is. And, <laughs> and, you know, we don't pick, we don't pick pages based on uh, the popularity of the page necessarily. That's not what GSO is meant to do. I mean, it would be nice if we started with the people who really were in the news and needed the page the most, but I really want you to pick pages that are important to you or, well, not important to you, but more you feel passionate about or you really are interested in because that's really what it's about. Yeah, I I think there was even one you sent me, you sent me a suggestion for a a topic. I can't even remember what it was, but it always, 
I didn't understand. It, it was more scientific, which wasn't particularly my background. And it was like, I tried to, I couldn't make sense out of that one. And, you know, there's all, there's so many other pages to work on. There's no reason to, I mean, the research goes much easier if you're passionate about something too. And there's plenty, definitely. I mean, I've been updating the podcast list and stuff and there's definitely plenty out there for every type of personality and every kind of interest. Uh, you know, it's just it's just about getting good information onto Wikipedia because that's where people go. I mean, I think that's p probably one of the reasons why I'm so pa I have an education background, and and it's really important um, to have um, solid information on there. And it may not be as complete, you know, as as you might like, but what's on there needs to be solid. You know what I mean? You can always add to a page. There's always information that could be added. But mm -hmm. at least make what the, the bones of the, the page should be really solid. There should be really good references on there and really good basic information. I don't know. That's, that, I think that's partly why I get so passionate about it, too. You know? totally, totally understand this. So many people will try to bring things to my attention and they'll say, this page right here needs a lot of work and this one, it says this and that, and you need to change this to that. And I get this all the time, especially on Facebook, because anytime the word Wikipedia comes up, it seems like somebody's tagging me or giving me a notification. And I just turn around and say, well, when are you signing up for the project? When, yeah. when can you start your training? <laughs> because there is so much work to be done. And it's not my passion, whatever page you've just given me to, to work on. I mean, I'm doing this for free, and so all are my editors. We don't get paid for this. And yeah. and I think that, um, you know, we need to have free will and choice and pick and choose what we want, and that's kind of the way I want to keep it. But I might take it and put it on our list and say, hey, if anybody's interested in this page, this needs some work. But it's going to probably just sit there, and it could be years because we only have, uh, you know, so many editors. and. And if it takes a month or two to get through one of these rewrites, <laughs> we're gonna <laughs> we have job security for years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, legitimate. Sometimes, legitimately, it takes that long. I mean, you know, I I think there's shortcuts that can be made, but only to a certain extent. And each one of us only has a finite amount of time that we can give to the project. Like you said, it's all volunteer. This this we're doing this volunteer. So you know, it's like we're. Where do you want to put your time? You know, I, I joined partly because I got tired of sitting around saying that something should be done, you know, and it's sort of like, well, okay, <laughs> you know, then do something, you know, and this was, wasn't sure actually when I signed up, you know, I kind of had an idea of what I might experience with it, but it's, it's been sort of like it and nothing like it at all. It's been, it's opened up another whole, area for me and and i'm glad you know i really feel like even when i make really small edits i feel like i'm helping out and that you know i can't reach ten thousand people on my own blog you know i but on wikipedia i might you know and and so um i feel like it's worth the time and effort and you get you get a lot of um there's a potential for a lot of payback from just you know reasonable amount of effort Totally, totally agree. You're you're speaking to the choir, right? <laughs> yeah, I know I don't have to. <laughs> but you will, you know, somebody could, I get people all the time who write to me and say, I'm going to start a podcast or I'm starting a new blog. And I'm like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> I don't mean to be mean. I mean, we need our podcasters and we need our blogs, definitely. But I mean, if you really, really want to do something that makes a serious difference, then this might be the project for you because this is where you're going to you will have thousands of uh, readers of your edits. It just takes time, you know, but it, it, yeah. it, it very well could happen. It just, you know, you might not never know that the person that, that the person who just read your page is mind has just been changed. You have no idea. It's not like a blog where you'll get feedback, but you know, you're doing the right thing. This is, this is how we educate the world. We, this, we know that people tend to find Wikipedia first when they're looking for information and they, they are going to get citations, hopefully, that they can follow their own, do their own research, and maybe change their mind. Mm -hmm. That's my that's my that's my idea, at least. Now I'm making this all up. I don't really know. Anything, <laughs> no. <laughs> just me. Well, I think you know, like if people just have, I'm at a point right now where I can put a little bit more time into it, 
but you know if you don't if you've only got 15 or 20 minutes a day or whatever that you want to put into it then there are things that could you could do small edits you can you can listen to a podcast you can you can do the backwards editing and that's just as valuable as if you're rewriting a whole page if you don't have time for a whole page when there's there's still plenty to do you know i oh, yeah. i look at i look at stuff that's not on my you know my to do list for um gso and you know there's some musicians i like or some authors main authors i've kind of like um looked at some of their pages and i can i can go in and add an isbn number to their book or whatever i mean there are the, and that all helps it all adds up mm-hmm. so i sure would does. say that you know if the, like the time constraint shouldn't i don't know this is a shoulda but the time <laughs> constraint shouldn't be an obstacle for for participating because you can you can pick the task to fit whatever time frame that you have Right, exactly. I I make everybody who works for us go through a training process that does involve a whole page rewrite. So that can take as long as somebody wants to take. I'm willing to just, you know, bear with them and and as they go, I will help them out. You know, if it takes months, it takes months. As long as they're still working on it, I don't mind. But once you're finished with your training, just like you say, lots of people listen to podcasts. All they have to do is just kind of take notes as they go along, maybe whenever they're doing their you know commute or whatever they just can kind of mentally at least take notes and then when they get home they can say i'm going to look at that page and see if this podcast is already listed on that person's page and and then go probably listen to the podcast a couple more times and make your edit it's not hard to do once you know what you're doing and you know what to look at and know what to listen for but it it really does make so much of an improvement not only to that person's wikipedia page but also to the podcast, because now that reference and now hopefully that podcast um, will get a little more attention and a little more, um, you know, credibility and hopefully some more listeners and subscribers and so on. And it improves our community overall. Yeah, I That's think how it's, I see it, that yeah, is. no, I think, <laughs> I think the training for me, because it was so step by step, it was helpful to have like an overview of the whole process and you're kind of like taking you take little bite size i don't know that i would have started editing wikipedia on my own i i maybe not that kind of personality to just jump right in um not really i'm sort of low tech so you know there is a little bit of a learning ter- curve in terms of learning the it's not hard but learning how to format wikipedia so so to take it in bite-sized steps and then to see the whole process i mean you know like you said before you're not going to learn everything in in that one process you know in the in the training but it does definitely give you an overview of you know what what a page what goes into making a page which i had never really thought about before um and it gets you familiar with looking at the talk pages and looking at the edit pages and the history and all that all that kind of stuff and that's really important you know totally agree totally agree i was i'm i'm also a very low tech kind of person that had to take on learning bits at a time how to do these kinds of things but i i tried to jump into learning how to edit wikipedia and was way over my head i am still not the greatest at this but i do have people on the team that help me all the time and uh you know give me feedback and i'm constantly learning you guys all the time and just listening yeah. to the questions you guys ask and somebody else comes through and says oh this is how you do it or this is how i handled it the last time i tried to do it and somebody will say oh here's another way of doing it there's so much to learn that wikipedia has tutorials they also have places you can go and ask questions and get feedback but it's just different i think because on wikipedia in general it's less what's the word for it they're they're more um you don't know who the person is. It's just a username. There's nothing really personal about them. You click on their user page, and possibly they have some information about themselves. But here on the forum, we're we're more friends. You know, we've met each other at conferences a lot of cases. We've shared pictures of our cats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we are Facebook friends in some cases, and some you know, we just know each other more. It's it feels more like a community, more social. Um, and that's what I think was missing yeah. with a lot of, with general Wikipedia, where they have their own language, and um, I didn't like that. I, I'm not a vis, I'm not a type of learner that learns by reading. I cannot 
No. Oh, I have trouble with that too, and it, it it's much nicer when I I've got and I'm not like I'm sort of a learn as you go person. So mm-hmm. if if something comes up that that I need help with, like like recently I, I was having trouble um, formatting the info box. Something wasn't showing up that I wanted to have on the page, and somebody else that that knew how to do that said, okay. I went in and I edited that, you know, I, and this is why it wasn't working and this is what I did to fix it and this is what you can do next time to fix it. You know, that, that those kind of skills are really helpful when somebody's able to say the, a lot of, like mostly with the technical stuff, you know, it's sort of like, okay, this is why that didn't work and here's, like you said, here's kind of a solution. Um, so, right, and, I think you're and missing I've found equal signs or something. Something, yeah. Yeah, yeah equal fine bar quote or something like that. Some, some, yeah, technical thing that you're missing. It's usually something little and it's sort of like you can stare at it for a long time and, and that's when the, like, searching on wiki to find how to fix it isn't really that. I mean, I guess the answers are there, but you really have to go through a lot to find the answer and it's really nice when somebody knows the technical part that can just say, oh, yeah, I... I I had that same problem a while ago, and this is how I fixed it. Or here's a page that is a sample. I think I was doing quotes, and you provided me with, with some pages to look at that also had quotes on it so that I could just format it from pages that already existed, and I wouldn't necessarily have thought of that. And that even it seems like something really small, but it saved me a lot of time. I could just go and see the example on a page that it did work, you know, so... Yeah, it can be very frustrating. <laughs> yeah, I know when it's just like a little like you've left off a bracket or something or an equal sign. It's like, <laughs> where is the damn thing? I do yeah. that too. I've done that with charts are really hard, and I, I'll I'll just say, okay, I am done. I have spent two hours trying to find this little bracket that I know must be missing, or I've added too many. I'm going to bed now. When I wake up in the morning, yeah. I want it fixed. Can somebody please do this for me? <laughs> And you're just frustrated. You're just, you know, and then, you know, 10 minutes later, somebody's like, okay, it's done. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, yeah. oh, thank you. I could not <laughs> see the darn thing. They're like, oh, yeah, it was like the 52nd one over there on the left, you know, and you're like, I couldn't see it. I just couldn't see it. Well, anyway, we'll, we could talk for a couple more hours, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. It has really been fascinating talking to you. This is the first time we've actually spoken. And I'm I know. So it's glad so we fun. had a chance to talk. For... Yay. Yay, yeah, it's a lot of fun. So um, let's just say goodbye for now, and uh, we'll get this edited and up on the places that I can get it up on. And um, you have a really terrific night, and um, I look Happy forward New to, Year. Oh, yeah. I can, I'm looking I can forward say to that your, now. Uh, yeah, Happy New Year to you as well. Um, I'm looking forward to a really great 2015, and watching that Mark Forsyth page just grow. Yeah, learning thanks, about Susan. Him. All right, well, good night.